Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Christina Sryakova uh, talking about homotypy type theory. Uh, thank you, everyone, and I would especially like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Um, so I'm at, the, I'm at the very opposite end of the spectrum of all the talks we've heard here today, uh, because I'm really a mathematician in a computer scientist's clothing, one could say. <laughs> um, so I do homotopy type theory, category theory, and that kind of stuff. And um, at one point of my talk, is to show that even mathematicians sometimes can and do and should code, even though the word coding is applied mostly to mathematical proofs rather than uh, you know your favorite app on your favorite type of smartphone. But there's an overarching theme that I noticed of the talks today, and that includes mine, is it can be summarized as how to, how to make sure your code doesn't contain too many mistakes, preferably none. And of course, that's also of concern to mathematicians because they are very error prone, uh, maybe even more than your basic model. And so we have the large number of math, various mathematical papers. And if anybody would like to wager a guess as to how many are in fact incorrect, in either, you know, a small bug that can be fixed to maybe a statement that's, you know, not even true. Um, so the thing is that, that if you point out to a mathematician that there's a bug in his proof, he's going to reply, well, but the theorem is true anyways, so no big deal. <laughs> but that is unfortunately not even the case most of the time. And one could ask, uh, well, what's the point? I mean, uh, a bug in the mathematical proof is not going to make a Boeing 737 crash, right? Well, my answer to that is maybe not today, but who knows, you know, 30 years from now. I mean, uh, if we think about it, number theory used to be considered one of the most obscure branches in mathematics that almost nobody in the real world would touch. And nowadays, it's the basic of, of modern cryptography. Uh, and in fact, you know, a lot of security relies on, on these results that have been known in number theory for, for years and are hopefully correct. Um, so these are the options to make sure that your paper doesn't contain mistakes. But as we see, especially because your coworkers are even more error prone than you are probably, at least that's what you would like to think. <laughs> um, Coding, and especially formalization, is often a better idea because your cock proof or agda proof is probably unreadable, but the existence of that is at least more convincing than the existence of a paper proof. And why is that? Well, because, of course, there's the old, age old question of who verifies the verifier. And in fact, when I was speaking at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, uh, this, was, this was exactly the the complaint that I received from mathematicians, well, yeah, I mean, like, how do I know that the proof theorem, that the proof assistant is correct? Like, if he verifies, if they verify my proof, I trust myself more than I trust the computer, right? That was, that was what I heard a lot of the times. Uh, but I would, I would beg to differ on that. And I, I think maybe some part of the audience hopefully agrees with me. Um, and now we come to the point that there are actually theorems that are basically uncheckable by, by humans um, and unprovable. Like, yes, we have, for example, the four-color theorem was proved by uh, the team around Georges Gontier at Microsoft Research. And that took a number of years. It, and, you know, that, that doesn't actually have a paper, pen and paper, or a textbook version of the proof because it is just so... Um, so involved that it really requires a computer to do all that work. Um, and then there's the Kepler conjecture, now it's known as Hale's theorem uh, by Thomas Hales. And in fact, when I was starting my PhD at, at Carnegie Mellon, he was there too, and he, he estimated that it would take about 20 human years 
to prove that theorem. Now, of course, he had P PhD students and uh, you know postdocs doing the slave work, but still, uh, you know, it required a computer to actually um, to actually do it, and it was a great success when when he did it. So, uh, yeah, the, for those of you who don't know, the conjecture says something along the lines of of that really the optimal way how to stack balls in a certain space is the obvious one, <laughs> right? So, which means put them next to each other with as few gaps as you have. And again, that, that is, so I'm, I'm very fortunate to have been part of, part of that group who at least remotely could observe this great effort it took to prove that theorem. And of course, the, the basic objection of every mathematician beyond the how can I know that you know the cock is the cock is correct and I'm wrong when it says I have a bug is that it's very hard and that's not surprising because mathematics has been developing for you know hundreds hundreds of years and starts from very basic principles from just a couple axioms so so to speak and builds everything up so. If we want to talk about, for, in, for example, spheres, you know, in large dimensions, even that, like even that geometry already requires a huge amount of development. And if you imagine that you would have to code this up, like starting with, you know, some set theoretic principles and then introduce real numbers and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's probably about the 20 human years, but, uh, but there is an easier way, a homotopy type theory. Um, which takes the approach that you don't actually have to build things from scratch if you want to talk about it. Because the crucial observation is that sometimes mathematical objects act just like data. And if we can work with data in a programming language and that data behaves just like a sphere, then if we prove something from basic principles in that programming language, then we have proved it about a sphere. Right, and that's a much more appealing process than, you know, defining a, your favorite topological space and reasoning about it explicitly. And, in fact, it started precisely because a famous mathematician um, was pointed out that his paper contained a very crucial mistake that wasn't spotted for a number of years. And that's a huge problem because he was a huge name, which means that if people saw that he said A was correct, then A was correct, obviously. And everybody cited that A was correct. And everybody cited the paper that cited his paper and so on. So to this day, we're not actually sure whether there are parts of mathematics that are false based on this theory theorem that he had, which unfortunately wasn't the case of this, yeah, the bug is there, but the theorem's true anyways. The theorem was actually false. As this, it was disproved by somebody. And it took about 10 years to work around that mistake. But that traumatized uh, Voivodsky to the point that he decided to just use you know, proof assistance from now on, because this is the, you know, the the, the bruised ego is such a such a hard thing for for such a brilliant mathematician that you know really the really he doesn't trust anything unless Cox says so anymore. Um, and what does it do? Well, it actually takes an old formal system, which is Martin Luff's um, constructive type theory, and it gives it a new meaning. So it just says like we've had actually these ideas for for years now due to, you know, Martin Luke, but as is often the case, usually people have a brilliant insight and they don't even know it for decades until somebody realizes just how brilliant that insight was and just how useful that piece of work actually is. And now we can prove, for instance, mathematical arguments, such as the fundamental group of the circle is the integers, or as we will see that the torus is the product of the two, in two, two circles, but entirely within a programming language. So there is, 
In principle, you don't have to know anything about mathematics or about the underlying mathematics. You have to have no geometric intuition to carry out these proofs that are completely correct, um, as Cox says so, or your favorite proof assistant. So let me just briefly, probably everybody here knows a lot of this stuff already. But as I said, we will be working with uh, constructive type theory, Martin Loof's type theory, where we use the, the usual uh, product sum and function types. And we also have a definitional equality, which allows us to decide when terms, not decide, but just to say when two terms are equal. But importantly, this is a meta-judgment. So we can't postulate that two, two terms are equal within the theory. And a major component of homotopy type theory are higher inductive types, as even my title suggests. But before we get to that, let's briefly revisit ordinary inductive types. Um, so everything we will be talking about this data will come with an induction and recursion principle. Um, so the recursion can be seen as saying that if I want to construct a function out of the natural numbers, then it's enough to say what zero should be mapped to and, given, and a successor given a value for the predecessor. So, of course, everybody knows this induction, uh, this recursion principle, but we will see that, in fact, even at higher dimensions, even a sphere, for example, or a circle, satisfies an analog of this basic principle. That's very surprising because, you know, what does a sphere have to do with the, you know, with the natural numbers in the programming language? These are two very, very different pieces of, uh, you know, mathematical structure that, um, do not have any reason to satisfy similar principles. And uh, well, the induction could be seen as saying that such a function is, in fact, unique. We will mostly talk about recursion. And so now we, can, now we come to the, to the main principle behind why, why mathematicians actually care about type theory. Well, it's because there's the propositions that types as types interpretation, which tells us that a type can be seen as a type of proofs. So for, exam for example, if we have a type A cross B, then that can be seen as having a proof of A, whatever the statement A is, and having a proof of B. And if I have an element of the pair, then I have to have an element of A and an element of B, which means I know that A and B must hold. And if I have an implication, that can be seen as a function taking a proof that A is true and returning a proof of B that B is true. So that's a proof of an implication. So this gives the system the, the constructive character in the sense that if I have a proof, then I actually have an, an, an algorithm, basically, a computation that produced it. And so now we see that something is missing from this, and that is we don't have a way of saying it inside the theory that two things are equal. As we mentioned, we have, we have the, the, the definitional judgment, but that lives on the meta level. We can't, po we can't postulate these equalities, and you know that's a pretty severe limitation for a mathematician to say that he can't talk about objects being equal or not. So that, that wouldn't sell very well. So fortunately, there is a notion of a type which allows us to basically postulate that things are equal. But as we will see, it behaves a little differently than what we would expect it to. And this was very surprising for Martin Loeff or you know, people that were around when this was invented. Because the only thing that it has, well, it has two things, but one of the things, the only real way how we can introduce 
an equality between two objects is when they are, you know, syntactically equal. So that's the reflexivity constructor. And then when Martin Luther was inventing this rule, he thought, well, if all we have is, uh, if the only way we can introduce a proof of identity is the reflexivity, then we should be able to reason about the type as if, you know, it only contained reflexivities. And th this kind of makes sense. I mean, if you can't put anything else in there, then, then you should not get anything out that you didn't put in. Um, so, in essence, this is the, the basics of induction, that we can reason as if the things we have in the type were of the canonical form obtained by the constructor. But the really interesting thing is, he, he thought, well, great, now we have internalized the meta, th the meta notion of, of definitional equality, right? Well, no, because in fact, he was stuck on proving that the postulate A equals B implies definitional equality, and that's because it's not true. And for a long time, this was a problem that confused a lot of people because it's like, well, I didn't put anything in there that is not reflexivity. Why am I not able to prove that, you know, all I have are reflexivities? And if it's not true, then, then what model do I have to show that it's not true? Except then some people came along and they said that that's because the standard interpretation of two objects as being equal or not is just one possible way. There is another way which can interpret it as things are equal if there's a path between them in a suitable way. A path has to be specified. And then it makes complete sense that you could have a path between two objects that is not just the identity because maybe there are several different ways how to go from A to B. And that, that suddenly made a lot of sense why this was the situation. Again, at that point, people didn't know what to do with it, and it was only in the late 2000s that homotopy type theory actually came along and showed that we have, in fact, models that are very different from the set theoretic models, and we will, we will briefly show how but the point of this slide is, yes, it's consistent. So we're not just talking about something that perhaps isn't even true. And the interesting thing now is that the proofs that we are capable of coming with inside this theory using pure induction are often much shorter and much more elegant than their mathematical counterparts. And this was also discovered more or less by mistake when you know, homotopy, type, homotopy theorists like Mike Schulman try to encode the classical proof that, for example, the, group of, the fundamental group of the circle is integers. And then Dan Licata came along and he's like, well, all these 50 lines are actually just induction. You, know, you can squeeze it into one or two lines. And then he's like, man, that's pretty genius. So, so then, the, basically nowadays, that's like a, a trivial, very, well, not trivial in hindsight, obviously, like the, basically the canonical way how to reason about things, and uh, we assigned it as an exercise in the homotopy type theory class to, you know, undergrads. Um, so that's pretty amazing, if you ask me, <laughs> um, that these people were actually able to come up with completely novel proofs. And so, as I mentioned, traditionally, the interpretation was that, okay, types are sets, element, uh, terms are elements of the sets, and the interpretation of the identity is, well, either those are the same element, in which case I have just the canonical inhabitant of the equality type, or they're not, in which case it's empty, right, and so on. But this is not particularly interesting. The new homotopical interpretation says, 
that types are topological spaces with a notion of a path from A to B. And the point, the terms are points, and if we have a, an equality from A to B, then we really have a path. And if we have an equality between a path and another path, that that's really a continuous deformation from one path to another. And again, the continuous deformation may or may not exist. So P and Q may or may not be equal themselves. So we can have two different ways to relate A to B. And a continuous deformation from P to Q may again itself be unique, or there may be a different continuous deformation. And again, there may be a continuous deformation between those continuous deformations, and so on. So we really have an infinite structure of paths, which is called an infinity groupoid. And we can even visualize it. So the nice thing is the paths behave very similarly to reflexivities, uh, sorry, to, to paths in space, which is actually how, how, this, how this arose. So we can form identity, we can invert them, we can go the other way, we can compose them, and we can also say things like paths are equal or not. So what we mentioned was, for instance, if we have a path that intuitively goes around a hole in the space, then that's not a path, that's not a path that would be continuously de deformable to the identity loop on the point P where we started. And why is that? Well, because there's a hole and we can't get over that hole, right? So, so this is the intuition, but of course, the beauty of the theory is that you don't have to care about, you know, all this, uh, all, all this topological background. And um, it basically captures this intuition purely on the basis of, purely at the level of a programming language. And now we come to the higher inductive types, which generalize the ordinary inductive types. So they again carry their own induction and recursion principle. And they are also a very powerful tool and a lot of different constructions arise as higher inductive types. Um, for example, all the spheres and the torus and, you know, quotients, even integers. So it's really very surprising how, um, how they come into play. And recently I was talking to Jennifer Paikin, who works on uh, quantum computing, and she actually uses higher inductive types in her work on quantum computing. Um, I can't imagine that I'm looking forward to her paper, but it's... It's pretty, pretty amazing how ubiquitous these, these things are. Um, and again, the people who invented them had this brilliant insight that they didn't even know about uh, how, how important it will come to be at some point. And now we come to one um, geometrically um, maybe interesting uh, theorem that is uh, nice to present in pictures. Uh, and that is the equivalence between the torus and the product of the two, cir two circles. And admittedly, that wouldn't impress a mathematician because in math, you define the torus as a product of two circles. So, <laughs> but we don't do that, and why is that? Well, because we remember that what we have in this, when we work inside type theory, are the induction principles. And, you can have two types that are equivalent, but each is formulated in a slightly different way that has an indu a different induction principle, and some are more convenient than others. So, as we will see, the induction principle for a torus is a lot more useful than, as formulated uh, than the induction principle for a product of cir two circles. And why is that? Well, because any time we reason about a product of inductive types, we have a nested induction. So we, we, we induce on the first argument and then on the second. And carrying out nested inductions is not something I would like to do on a daily basis. Um, so it's much easier to just combine it into one induction that doesn't, doesn't require this nesting. And then the work is just done once and encapsulated in this equivalence between the two induction principles. And then we can pick whichever you know, is more suitable for the problem.
So how do we actually write the circle as a higher inductive type? Well, we have a point, which we call the base, and we say that base is an ordinary point constructor for the type being defined. And this is very similar to, for example, stating that zero is a constructor for a natural number. But then we have a loop constructor, which is a higher constructor, and it says that we, in fact, have a path from base to base. And this doesn't fit the, the, the schema for an ordinary inductive type because we're not actually postulating the existence of, an, of, a, of, a, of a term of S1. We're actually postulating the existence of a term of the path type on S1. So that is what makes it higher. And one could think that if we assert base and loop, then there's only one path, right? Well, I mean, there's of course the identity path on base, but then we only have one path from base to base. But that is actually not true because we remember that an inductive type is not just the constructors themselves, but anything generated by those constructors. And this is similar with the higher inductive type. So it's the constructors plus whatever structure they generate based on the ambient theory. So in particular, since we can compose an inverse path, then we don't, don't just have, you know, loop. We also have loop square. We can go twice around the base, three times, four times, minus one times, and so on. And now we can see why the fundamental group of the circle is the integers. Uh, the fundamental group of the circle is, you know, the, the classification of, of the path type at, at a point. And yeah, we can see that we can go any number of positive times around the circle, or we can go any number of negative times on the, around the circle. Um, and what does the circle, in, re, what does the principle of recursion for a circle, circle do? Well, this is actually very simple. It just says, well, anytime you give me something that also looks like a circle, I should be able to construct a function from a circle, circle to it, since you know the circle is generated is the free structure generated by these constructors. So if you give me a point, then I know what to map base to, right? So I just say base goes to C, right? And if you give me a loop, L, well, or, you know, loop is the name for the canonical con loop at base, but if you give me some other L on C, then I know that I can take this loop for the circle and map it onto L. And then I've mapped the whole circle because I don't have anything else that's not generated by these constructors. So that is the recursion principle. And as we can see, that's a purely type theoretic construct. So now we have it and now we can forget about all the geometry there and just reason based on this recursion principle. And if we compare it with like the usual definition of a circle, there's nothing about complex numbers nothing about distances, you know, nothing about any number systems. So this is just data at this point. And we can prove things just within the programming language that we have. Similarly, torus. Now we have a point that is kind of the base, base point, and now we have two different loops on it, P and Q, and the proof that they commute. And it's not at all obvious, at least it definitely wasn't obvious to me why this would define a torus. Well, if we look at a picture of this form, for example, the surface area can be seen as the, as, as the theta that we have there, which is a constructor that postulates an existence of a continuous deformation from P, Q, P composed with Q to Q composed with P. And what does, a, if I'm a continuous deformation from Q to P, from P to Q, to, from P composed with Q to Q composed with P, then what do I do? Well, uh, I know nothing about P and nothing about Q, so the only way I know how to continuously deform P is to take it, take it to P, right? So basically, the only thing I can do is to identify P with P. 
because again, these are arbitrary general paths. Okay, so now if I carry on P, carry P on, on to P, then I've created these two little circles on Q because I collapsed the endpoints. And now we do the same thing with the Q. So the only way I can identify Q with Q is to carry it on to itself, which means I've collapsed the cylinder onto this tube that is a torus. And now we see that, in fact, it should arise as a product of two circles because we have one circle in one dimension and the other one in the other dimension. But how do we prove it? I mean, these two, these two types look extremely s different, right? Like one has two loops and in addition, a higher path, theta, and the other one is just a point and a path. So they look completely different and maybe we don't know what to do. But actually we do because we remember that we have, we have induction principles that allow us to reason about this structure. So again, the torus recursion, we can already guess what it, what it should look like. It should say that if you give me something that also looks like a torus, that means it also has a point, it also has two loops on it, and it also has um, a path that says that the two loops commute, then we should be able to map the entire torus you know, in, a, in a unique way onto this structure. So, so now we can, now we already see the pattern. So, um, you know, in principle, if you give me a specific higher inductive type, then I should be able to come up with these equations just, you know, by eyeballing the, the structure and it's always correct. <laughs> so, uh, so to speak, so far. So, so again, you know, programming language minded people like this because uh, that means that's data that behaves, you know, just like any other data and we can even write a little script that generates these rules for us, right? Um, so now, how do we actually prove this by using these induction rules? Well, going from T to the product of two circles, we remember that we need to come up with a base point because the torus has a base point. Okay, well, we have two base points. We have, well, we have one base point, which means we can pair it with itself. That's pretty much the only thing we have because the only point that we can get a hold of is the base point. But this is good, so we have that. And now we need to come up with two different ways how to go from base to base, how, could, how to go from base paired up with base to itself. Well, the obvious thing to do the obvious things are very often correct in homotopy life theory. I really like that. So um, we can, well, take loop, because that's the only thing we have in the circle, and pair it up with the identity in one way or in the other way. And now we have to prove that they actually, that this whole thing actually commutes, right? And that's pretty obvious, because the identity composed with loop is just loop itself. and loop composed with identity is just loop itself. So it indeed does commute. So we're good. We now have a function in one direction. And what about the other direction? Well, I, that's kind of cheating because I just told you how to do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if we now go in the other direction, well, that's a little harder because of the nested induction. I mean, we can't just avoid the nested induction altogether, but we can only do, we only have to do it once. So again, for the base and base type, a ba base and base case, we need to come up with a point, which is, you know, there's a canonical point in there. And similarly, for these other two cases, we have P and Q. And, you know, so, so this structure, actually, we see how it aligns. Um, and then, of course, to prove that they, they actually compose to the identity um, requires carrying out some path algebra. But again, we only do it once, and then we can use whatever induction principle we want. <laughs> 
So now I'm coming to the end of my talk where we showed basically how homotopy type theory can be used to argue about you know, mathematical objects and carry out pretty, um, pretty involved arguments that we know are actually correct. And so this is just, this was done like years ago when homotopy type theory was just starting. And nowadays we have really some huge theorems um, f or even some new results. It's called synthetic homotopy type theory, synthetic homotopy theory when um, you know, arguments from, from mathematics are carried out in an entirely syntactic fashion that is independent of a, any, any kind of prior development. Um, and now we obtain you know, fully formal proofs of the proofs are novel and sometimes even the results are novel. And this actually gave rise to the so-called cubicle type theory where people started thinking, well, how do we make it even better? You know, how, how do we make it even more suitable for formulating this type of arguments? And that gave rise to, um, you know, incorporating even more geometrical structure into the type theory. And yes, I, probably none of this will help you code better, but it at least shows that we now have a way to formulate arguments, mathematical arguments that are verified by, by a theorem prover that we know are correct. And again, what I really like is that I'm able to you know, reason about these things without having to know an entire amount of you know, geometry, homotopy theory, and I mean, that, that's, not, that's not easy stuff necessarily uh, that people reason about. So um, I think that's, that just shows how the power of programming and you know, formal systems in general. So thank you. questions? Hi, thank you. That was great. Thank you. Um, uh, so can you formalize proofs in homotopy type theory using cock or do you need a different yeah, so, set of tools to do uh, that? Yeah, so the nowadays we have three canonical proof assistants, which is the cock. Of, it's a version of cock called hot cock. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, so uh, sorry, I <laughs> that, that was the question. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, so so that's that's where I started, and then some people moved to Agda, and the newest fad is the Lean Proof Assistant, which is in fact entirely developed more or less on the basis of, of homotopy type theory. So again, if somebody knows how to code in cock, then they're pretty much ready to, you know, code up any homotopy type theory proof. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Okay. Thank you very much, Christina.